Hey, good morning, Restoration Church. For those of you in person, thank you for being here. So good to see you guys. For those of you online, thank you for joining us today as well. One of the themes that came across so heavily over the last year was God's goodness. It's something I had to constantly remind ourselves of, you know, as the world was kind of being flipped upside down. <clears throat> I want to read out of Psalm 136 to begin our time together this morning and then just reflect on, on God's goodness for just a second before we jump into a time of worship. Psalm 136, verse 1 says, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods. Why? His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. Why? His love endures forever. And then it goes on for another, like, 55 verses <laughs> over and over and over again. And uh, one thing that we're going to reflect on today in just a little bit is that uh, one of the pictures that the Satan tried to paint of God was that he was not good. One of the very first pictures that he painted of who God was was that he was not good, that he was not for us, that he is not on our side. Certainly he does not love us. And so we're going to fight against those lies this morning by singing some songs and help us set our minds and our hearts on God's goodness. Would you please stand for those of you in person? Join us. I was blind, now I'm seeing in color. I was dead, now I'm living forever. I had failed, but you were my redeemer. I've been blessed beyond all measure. I was lost, now I'm found by the Father. I've been changed from a ruin to a treasure. I've been given a hope and a future. Well, I've been blessed beyond all measure. Well, I am counting every blessing, counting every blessing, letting go just in when I cannot sing. Well, I am counting every blessing, counting every blessing. Surely every season you are good to me. Oh, 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 oh you are good to me. I am counting every blessing, 
counting every blessing surely every season you are good to Father, right now we want to declare that you are good and that all praise and all thanks belongs to your name because your love endures forever, endures through all of our sin, Father, and all the ways we reject and rebel against you. You continue to persist in your love of us. You continue to remind us of what you have accomplished on our behalf, and you cover us again with the shed blood of Jesus Christ to remind us that we have been forgiven once and for all, Father, and now by this grace, this gift of grace, this thing that we did not deserve, Father, this thing we did not earn, that we never would have been good enough, Father, to, to have deserved or to have earned. But because of your great love by which you loved us, you sent your son Jesus into the world to forgive us. And I pray now, Father, that we would 
embrace this incredible gift and let it do its transformative work in us. Let it change us, Father, to become people after your own heart, to become people who look more like Jesus every single day. May we submit and surrender more and more and more and more of Jesus, less of us. More of Jesus, less of us. Thank you, Father, for what you've done. Thank you for proving the devil a liar, Father. When he tried to paint those pictures of of a prideful, stingy, greedy God, a God who does not care for us and go, does not love us, Father. I pray, I, I thank you, Father, that you, you have proven who you are and that you are trustworthy. And this image now of you loving us and caring for us and lifting us, Father, out of the depths of our sin, Father, may be the picture and the great knowledge that we have of you. We thank you, Father, for who you are and what you've done. In the name of Jesus, we pray these things. Amen. You may take a seat. Welcome, Restoration Church friends, to uh, rainy, rainy, rainy Sunday morning. Rainy Sunday. Mm -hmm. We're actually taping this on Sunday. Rarely. Rarely. This yeah. Is, yeah. And it's not ideal either. So let's hope we don't pick on each other too much. Uh, if you've been with us a little while, you're ready to let us maybe know who you are. There is a connection card being dropped in the comments right now. If you're with us in person, you can get that same card in the lobby. Okay. And if you fill it out and let us know who you are, we will donate $3 to uh, a local food bank here in the Philadelphia region. But also you'll get a cool teal mug out of it. So it's just a little gift from us to say thank you and welcome to Restoration. Mm-hmm. And I just want to say really quickly, because we're talking about online and in-person mm -hmm. differences, next Sunday is Easter. Next Sunday is and Easter. And I just want to remind everyone that we will be uh, at church online, that platform, if you like watching there and chatting along with us, at 9 o'clock. Mm -hmm. And we will be live streaming on <clears throat> Facebook at 1030. Because yep. we know we have people in both, both that worlds. watch in both ways. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep. And is it always on YouTube? It is, yeah. Yeah. A so bit. it's always yep. on YouTube. Yeah, it's always yeah. on YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so Easter, right? Yeah, we might as well, we'll go back to Good Friday. All things, all things Easter. So first of okay. all, yesterday was awesome. Yes, thank you everyone. Like that was a really good event. Mm -hmm. And I kind of like that it was like gated entry. Like, it kind of actually made for a really nice consistent flow throughout the event. Cool. That's good. And people love the maze, I think. Did yes, you like, you like your maze, maze was not a fail. I think it was great. <laughs> Yes. People doubted my maze. I think if it had been went windy, you might have had some issues. True. But it wasn't. It was a gorgeous, beautiful day. Incredible. So your caution tape stayed we, up. And we met a ton of new friends and yeah. a ton of new people came. Yeah, so that's great. really cool. Glad that we could do something like this again. After, yeah, so thank you to everyone of, who made that possible. Yeah. Uh, yep. Seriously, thank you, everybody. Yeah. Awesome. From cleaning up the beds outside to mm. setting up to coloring the brick wall for our photo stop to yeah. all of the many, many hours put in by... Um, Julie, Nicole, and Brittany. Tom Pegg said to rebuild oh. part of the catapult late, On Friday and late Saturday, Friday night. With his friend Joe. Thanks, so, Yeah, Tom thank you. Seriously. I mean, so many people helped make that a reality. And they kept but it was, tweaking it the whole time because it was, it, was, it was funny. If you got to experience the catapult, you know what we're talking about. Yeah. And eventually they're shooting into the street. So. <laughs> awesome. Really cool, though. I, I yes. love that part of who we are. Yes. So, um, we have this golden egg hunt that's going on. People are, I'm, I'm not receiving hate emails No, yeah, yet. you are. Pretty much. People are giving me a lot of uh, but they're being behaving really no, well. Yeah, they are. They are. And they're not asking. And questions. I've heard that a ton of people are just having fun with it. Yeah. I've I gotten like their families are coming together to interact, or and there's a lot are, of laughing yeah. going on. So mm -hmm. it's just I, I I hope that it is accomplishing its purpose. Um, of driving people nuts. Of driving people nuts. For sure, that's being accomplished. We're gonna throw out a uh, freebie. Sunday is our freebie day, so you're gonna get a clue after the service. So check our website once the service is done and. Okay, so you know that statistically, like in the past, it's usually found between clue six and seven. I don't think that's happening this year. Uh, no. No, see, he's I making it extra hard, guys, because it is worth $500. I know. I so. Know. It's a lot of money. <laughs> so, oh, but, but, but my hope is that it's found by next Saturday. <laughs> Can someone find us here? Please. Yeah, try. <laughs> no, seriously, though, if you were to decipher the clues, very possible somebody could find it right now. No doubt. Yeah, but they need like a decoding key or something you know I'm, what I'm, trying I'm just to saying it is findable from the clues that are out there anyway so that's happening check the serve if, if you're if you're in for the hunt then check the serve uh the website after the service um good friday is happening this yeah. friday yep 
It is the day that we remember that Jesus died upon the cross. Very, very important day in the church's life. And so we are having a service in person. I think there are some spots left open if yeah. people would like to come and join us for a service of reflection, prayer, worship. And then um, you can also join us online at our online platform and also Search Facebook. online, Facebook, yeah. 7 p.m. Friday evening, this coming Friday. Mm -hmm. And then Easter. What's going on Easter, Em? Well, it's like... We're full. We're full. <laughs> We're full. This has been a problem, friends, and it's a great problem. It's a great problem. But it's also a COVID problem. It wouldn't be a problem if we didn't mitigate and stay six feet apart and That's all right. of that. So um, our 9 o'clock service as of like an hour ago only has two spots left. And our 1030 has maybe 12. And I believe there's two spots in the pre-K class. Maybe. They may already be gone. So this is, you know, I don't know. So because of that... What have we decided to do? We are going to have an outdoor sunrise service. That is a real thing. It is a real thing, absolutely. Yeah. You know that uh, Jesus rose essentially at sunrise because when the when the Marys got there, right just away. after sunrise, Jesus, um, Jesus was already Jesus was already risen. So, mm -hmm. um, we're gonna do a sunrise service. It's going to be an acoustic sunrise service. On the lawn, out on the front, lawn, here out at front. Restoration. Yep. 6.30. Now, I'm usually awake by that time. It's making this. He's always awake on Sundays at Sundays, that time. That's yeah. the only day of the week he sees any semblance of sunrise. So, it's not a stretch nope. for you on Easter. Nope. But we know that this may not appeal to some of you. But it also may be a great way to kick off your day. You Absolutely. don't even have to shower. No. Just come. Just roll on over when you're whatever. Yeah. With your coffee. And, and a, your lawn chair. And a lawn chair. That's okay. right. Come on over. Yeah. And uh, we will celebrate the risen Lord together. Mm -hmm. But here's what we are wondering. You ready? For people who've already registered for the 9 or 1030, we're wondering if any of you are early birds and would consider coming to an outdoor service um, to make room for more people who are looking for a more traditional time frame for, um, to attend church. So... If you would be willing to do that, we are going to email all of the registered guests the link to sign up for the Sunrise service. If you do that, then we'll adjust your registration on our end to open up some more seats for the 9 and 1030. Because here's the deal. Like, a lot of you jumped, which is awesome, and we're so glad you're coming back, but you jumped on that registration. That doesn't even include, like, our people who typically just come out on Easter. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of people that we would love to make sure can get included. Of course, you can watch online. <sighs> Yep. What were you going to say? I was going to say, and we've heard that a lot of people have invited guests who yes. are like, oh yeah, I'm coming, but they're not registered. Yeah. And also I would really encourage you to register with your guests so you can sit together. Like if you're already in kind of a germ pod together, you know, your, your COVID pod, Get together. sit together at church because it'll open up more, more seats. seats. Yep. And you can let us know. Um, you could also email us about that too. Yeah. More info this weekend. On we that, have a lot but... of work to do to figure out how we're going to fit everyone. Yeah. But yeah. if you want to come to that sunrise service, we're going to release that link to our registered guests first. But by Tuesday morning, sunrise service link will be live. And hopefully we'll have opened up a few more seats at our 9 and 1030 for others. Yeah. It's a thing. That's the plan. It is a thing. And if, if you don't get to register to be inside and you really wanted to, we invite you to join online and come next the next Sunday. Yeah. We're here every right. Sunday. Yeah. We welcome more people back. 9 for now. Yeah. Right? 9 and 10.30 for now. Yeah. All right. With so kids minute to 1030. Yes. So um, we exist off the generosity of our people, right? We say this all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, the only reason we we're able to do things like yesterday and how phenomenal it was and to bless our community uh, was because of the generosity of our people. Which is just so cool that it's a free event. I know. Because we gave away a lot of stuff. I know. Like we came home with arms full of. We did. And stuff. and the, the golden egg hunt that everyone is loving mm -hmm. and they're loving my clues is because of we are a generous church. Anyway, so um, there are uh, five, ways to, five easy ways to give, and the fifth one is, of course, the Dropbox in the back um, for those of you in person. But mm -hmm. um, thanks for your contributions uh, here. Mm -hmm. uh, we exist because of, well, because of Christ, of course, but in the, and way, all that in the way we do. has accomplished. Yeah, yeah. So mm -hmm. uh, let me say prayer for us. Oh, jeez. You hit me really hard. Heavenly <laughs> okay. Father, thanks for who you are, uh, the generosity that you uh, shower upon us through your grace. And every day, Father, we are just bathed in your generosity. And so I pray that we might be a, com a people who are mimicking you and modeling you in all that we do, striving to do that, Father, so that our community might come to a more intimate knowledge of who you are. And we do pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. 
Hey, just to remind you that next week is Easter, again, which means that we're starting a brand new series. Next week we are starting a series titled Aftershock. I'll describe next week why there's a butterfly as part of the imagery uh, for the series. But for several weeks we're going to walk through portions of the book of Acts and learn what Jesus rising from the dead did to shape the culture and the very fabric of their society and their understanding of how the world works. When Jesus died and rose, it was like a bomb went off. Crazy things began to happen. I don't know if you guys have ever read through um, the the stories of the resurrection, what happened subsequently afterward, but crazy things started to happen. The the veil that separated the presence of God from the common man was torn in two from the top to the bottom. This thing was six inches thick. Uh, The graves of saints broke open, and people were resuscitated, and these dead people began to walk around Jerusalem. Crazy things began to happen, and then for the next, of course, 2,000 years, crazy things began to happen because of this one event in history. This event set off an aftershock, and wave and wave and wave of shocks now continue to change lives and have this ripple effect through history because of this one event in history. And so we are going to look at the first century church, that very first experience of how Christians interacted with this event in history and what it did to shape their culture and shape their relationships, shape their priorities. What did having this new king sitting upon the throne of the world do to change the world? So I'm really excited about this series and what we can learn about what it means to be the church, what it means to be followers of Jesus. So join us for this series, Aftershock, beginning next week. But today we're finishing up our series, In the Mouth of a Lion. Now if you've not already, I highly recommend that you go back and listen uh, to the three prior messages of the series, especially last week. Emily did a phenomenal job with her message last week, and there's so many truths, so many insights that she brought about that I think we all need to continue to remind ourselves of them and hear to. And so if you have yet to listen to this series, I would really encourage you to do that. You can find us on podcast. You can find us on Facebook. You can find us on YouTube. You can find us on the website. All over the place, you can find these messages. I would encourage you to do that. We titled the series In the Mouth of a Lion because in Scripture, there are two lions that are primarily portrayed. One of those lions is a lion that is seeking to devour its prey. For uh, Peter tells us that there is a, a lion who is on the prowl looking to devour. This is how he categorizes or, or classifies Satan. And in the mouth of this lion, life can feel horrible. It can feel miserable. We become self-centered and selfish and self-seeking and self-defending, self-protecting. We, we establish our identities on conditional life experiences rather than on the unconditional life of God. And when we do that, we always hurt, and we always then hurt other people. But there's another line that is portrayed in Scripture, and it is the line of Jesus. And in the mouth of this line, we are protected, right? We've shown this video a few times. This little cub doesn't realize there may be alligators in that, in that pond. And so what does the mother lion do? She comes and she picks that cub up and moves him to protection, In the mouth of the lion of Jesus, we are protected, we are carried, we are cared for. But these lions are, of course, at war. And so in the beginning, we're told that God creates a very beautiful, ordered reality out of darkness and chaos so that life can begin to flourish. He appoints humans made in his image to rule it and to to advance it and to care for it. But then most of us know the story. If you've ever read through Scripture, you've come across this story. Genesis 3, right? The serpent slithers into God's beautiful, ordered creation and begins to wreak havoc. This creature is in rebellion against God's creation and against the Creator. Here's what we're told. Now the serpent was more crafty than all of the wild animals, than any of the wild animals that God had made. Now here's the thing. When we read this, we immediately think that the serpent is... A snake, okay, well, obviously a serpent is a snake, so we assume that the serpent is Satan, right? But the first century audience, the, 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 not even the first century audience, they would have thought that too probably, but the first audience who heard this wouldn't have assumed that. 
the first audience wouldn't have assumed that the snake was representing of Satan. The, the satanic theology was very undeveloped by this point of the story. The creature is the Bible's very first portrait of evil. This creature is distorting what God has purposed for good, and he is dragging creation back into chaos, back into darkness. And so the first audience to receive the story were the Israelites, just coming out of slavery by the Egyptians. And so imagine that you are an Egyptian slave. All of you have known, your, literally your entire life, from the day that you could walk probably, your entire life was lived in the clay pits. And you were just making bricks for your entire life. That was your purpose on this planet. That was your job upon this planet was to make clay bricks. And so you're living under the hot Egyptian sun. Your hands are cracked and dried. All of your skin is cracked and dried. You are bleeding from head to toe. All you know is the whip of the Egyptian slave owner against your back. And then there is this man sitting up on a parapet, right? He's watching over all of it, the pharaoh. And the symbol of the pharaoh was the snake. The snake in its upright attacking position. Now the snake was a very prominent figure in Egypt and in Egyptian mythology. Asps and cobras destroyed harvest. They would bite children. They coil themselves up in cooking pots. So you go to cook that stew and you open up that pot lid and the snake jumps out at you and bites you. Mythology of the snake had power to paralyze someone with their eyes. There were snake demons who haunted children. Some of them were winged, some spat fire, some were armed with knives. The snake was a feared symbol of chaos within Egyptian mythology. And of course, if you are an Israelite slave living in Egypt, you hear of the feared snake. The serpent is a serpent of chaos, a snake of chaos. And here he is attached to the originator of that chaos. The way that you are feeling the way you are, the horror, the misery that you are experiencing in those clay pits is because of this man... The snake, and it wasn't just King Tut that had the snake upon his pharaoh. It was a common image of the pharaoh. He was the one whom you feared most. He was the one who was making your life so miserable. The snake, in other words, it's a creature of chaos. It's an emblem of evil. And in the Genesis story, he slithers his way into the peace and the purpose that God had established with humans, and he props himself up in attacking position. And he says, did God really say, you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Have you guys ever been in a conversation like this? Like there's somebody off to the side and you're having a conversation. It's a private conversation. But there's someone over here and they're kind of listening in maybe a little bit and they're, they're trying to understand exactly what's going on. So the snake slithers over and he says, he, uh, he didn't really just say that, did he? He couldn't have really just, I, 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 my ears must be deceiving me. I cannot believe, he did not really just say that, did he? Like they couldn't believe that somebody would actually have those words come out. How defensive, how, how demeaning God is being to you, Eve. God didn't really tell you not to eat of the fruit of the garden, did he? And Eve responds, well, yeah, yeah, he did. Why do you ask? And the snake responds, oh, you know, I, I knew it. I knew it. I mean, come on, Eve, you were the one who was cultivating the earth. You're the one out here sweating your brow, you know, doing all the hard work, doing all the labor, producing the crops. You should be able to eat whatever you want to eat. You're the one making the stuff grow. Eve, you should be able to eat whatever you want. Well, Eve replies, yeah, yeah, we're free to eat, but he did tell us that we can't eat from the tree in the middle of the garden. Otherwise, we would die. It actually sounds like God is protecting us. And of course, the serpent comes along and says, well, yeah, well, it might sound like that, the creature of chaos says, but you won't die. The only reason God says that is because he's protecting himself. He knows that if you eat it, your eyes will be opened and the truth about God will be revealed. Here's that picture that Satan, or the serpent begins to paint of who God is. You will become like him. And if you become like him, then you know what? God's going to have to scoot over and he's going to have to share his throne. And he'd much rather keep you in the dark. He'd rather keep your eyes closed and keep you under his foot. And he'd much rather keep his throne to himself, right? He is painting this picture of a God that is, that is threatened by humanity, a God that is greedy and, and manipulative and power-hungry. And all of a sudden, Adam and Eve begin to doubt. 
if God is for them. And if God is good. And if God loves them. They begin to doubt God's intentions for them. Remember that humanity was made to be like God, right? They're created in God's image to co-rule and to co-labor with God. But all of a sudden, they are met with this idea for the very first time. They're met with this idea that God may not be on the same page with them. He may not be on the same team as them. He may not really mean what he says. Otherwise, wouldn't they have a knowledge of what is good and evil too? If they were really made to be like God, wouldn't they have a knowledge of what is good and evil too? Wouldn't they have everything that God does? See, Satan, the serpent just paints this picture of God that is conniving and manipulative and power-hungry and greedy, and he is keeping the eyes of Adam and Eve closed so that he doesn't have to share his life with them. All the serpent does is point out that this knowledge of good and evil is a component of life that God has, but they don't. And if they were made to be like God in God's image, then they should have it too. Then they would have it too. And so the serpent tells them to go and to get it. See, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, did you guys know that your perception creates your opinions and your perception is informed by past experiences? And so Eve looks at this tree, right? She looks at this tree and she looks like, it looks like all the other trees in the garden. It's, it's not ugly. It's not a nasty-looking tree. And the, the fruit aren't prickly and thorny. The fruit are actually really attractive, and they're actually really beautiful. And, and her perception of what would be evil isn't this tree. It looks like all the other good trees in the garden. It looks like all the other good fruit in the garden. It looks like something that should be nice and should benefit her. It looks attractive, it looks nice, it can't be bad. Plus, if it's going to help me be like God, which is ultimately what God wants for us, then we should take it. And so she took some of the fruit and she ate it. And not only that, she called Adam over and said, hey, hon, try this. I took it from that forbidden tree. You know the one that God said we shouldn't eat and if we did, we were going to die? Yeah, I took it from there. You should have some. It's really good. And because men are idiots, he took some and he ate it. And at that point, several things began to happen, but most prominently, their hearts were filled with pride. Their hearts were bent in on themselves. They became self-consumed and self-absorbed and selfish, self-reigning, self-centered, self-protecting. Remember, if you were with us throughout the series, that is exactly where Satan wants to keep you. He wants to keep you internally driven, thinking only about yourself, self-centered, selfish, self-protecting. But here's the thing, when you're at the center of your behavior, when you're at the center of your thoughts, when you're at the center of your actions, everybody else becomes a threat to you. Everybody else becomes an enemy to your own advancement, which means that relationships utterly are destroyed when you put yourself at the center of your existence. When you are all about yourself, you will hurt and you will hurt others. This is why pride is essentially vice, uh, is, is the essential vice and utmost evil. All other sins flow and grow from pride. It is the complete anti-God state of mind. But have you ever thought about pride? It's such an odd thing if you think about it. If you really wrestle with it and spend a few minutes thinking about pride, it's such an odd thing. Everybody fights for it, yet we rarely admit that we're guilty of it. We celebrate it in ourselves, but we loathe it when we see it in other people. There is no fault which makes someone more unpopular, and yet we are unconscious of it in ourselves. And the more we have it in ourselves, the more we dislike it in others. The more proud you are, the more, the more proud you are, the more someone else's pride is going to offend you. Pride is essentially competitive and it's always relational, right? Pride doesn't delight in having something. It only delights in having more than the next person. It doesn't delight in being rich or clever or good looking. It only delights in being richer and more cleverer or better looking than the person next to you. If everybody else became equally rich, equally clever, equally good-looking, there would be no pride. There would be nothing to be proud of. It's in seeing what other people lack and celebrating those qualities in yourselves that makes pride so disgusting. C.S. Lewis wrote in his brilliant work, Mere Christianity, that it is pride which has been the chief cause of misery in every nation and every family since the world began. Think about that. 
The devil is perfectly content to see you becoming chaste and brave and self-controlled, provided all the time he is setting up in you the dictatorship of pride. Just as he would be quite content to see your swellings cured if he was allowed in return to give you cancer. For pride is spiritual cancer. It eats up the very possibility of love, of contentment, or even common sense. And so, really quick, do me a favor. Do a quick inventory of all your relational problems. There is an evil behind it. A serpent of chaos who is poking and tempting your pride or your spouse's pride or your ex's pride or your child's pride or your co-worker's pride or your child's pride. It is pride which has been the chief and cause of misery in every nation and every family since the world began. You see, the picture the serpent painted of God that Adam and Eve dreaded and despised was in fact the very people that they turned into. It's so twisted, right? It's so manipulative. It's so conniving. The serpent painted a picture of himself. He convinced Adam and Eve that it was a picture of God. And in their fear, they turned them into the very thing that they wanted absolutely nothing to do with. He turned our own hearts against us. And if you want to know how proud you are, just ask yourself, how do I feel among other people's success? When people who are in a similar stage of life as me and doing similar work as me and in similar relationships, similar occupations, similar stage of life, how do I feel when they do something that seems successful? When they get the promotion, when they get the deal, when they get the company car, when they go to Disney World, when they move into the bigger and better house, when they buy the new car. Ask yourself how regularly you see faults in others because one of the things that pride does is that it filters out the evil in ourselves while it filters out the good in others. If you don't know how proud you are, ask yourself, well, how often do I put on a mask in order to appear different than I actually am? When I'm among those people, when I'm at that party, do I put that mask on and pretend that I am somebody different who, than who I really am? If you want to know how proud you are, ask yourself how you respond to rebuke or challenge or truth-telling against your own character. Are you defensive or do you acknowledge when it's coming from someone who loves you? My friends, pride will kill you and it will kill your relationships. And this is one reason that God told Adam and Eve that death would come, right? When they put themselves first, when they put their will above his will, that death would come. Not only does pride initiate death, but pride will also keep us from reaching out for a savior. And instead, pride will always turn us towards religion. You see, one of the things that happened when they ate of the truth is that they began to feel shame. We're told, then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized then that they were naked. Right? Their sin is exposed before God. And so what do they do knowing that they are guilty, that they are broken, that they are ashamed, but also that they are full of pride? Right? This pride that wants to defend and self-protect and is self-centered and, and, and self-focused, what do they do knowing that they are exposed, that they are guilty, but they're also full of pride? Well, they do something in an attempt to fix it. They do something in an attempt to cover it up. They sewed fig leaves together. And they made covering for themselves. But that didn't take away their guilt. And that didn't take away their shame. And so what do they do when their conscience bears down on them as God approaches? Well, they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. They try to fix it by running away. My friends, these are the very first acts of religion. Their attempt to fix their own problem. I know I talk about this all the time. Uh, It's an important conversation because I think we need to understand it because this is a universal attempt to solve a universal problem. And so all of our coworkers who are far from God, all of our family members who are far from God, all of our community who is very post-Christian and really wants nothing to do with the church, they are all experiencing this and they are all doing this, right? They feel guilty, they feel shame, they feel that they are broken, and they, they, they know that their experience upon this planet is not what it ought to be. And so what are they doing? They are trying to fix it on their own. 
They are doing something to fix the problem that they know that they have. You see, everybody is religious. Everyone is religious. Religion is just that thing that we do, that attempt at fixing the problem that we all know that we have. Now, we don't make garments made of leaves. We don't hide in the bushes, but we do hide in other ways, right? We do conceal what we're doing. We do run. Sometimes we lie. Sometimes we cheat. Sometimes we murder people to fix our problems. Sometimes we turn to the bottle to wash it all away. Sometimes we turn to drugs to numb the pain. Religion tells us to do something to make ourselves feel better about our guilt. Religion does not because it cannot remove our guilt. And because a heart full of pride will not admit fault when hiding and covering it up didn't work at removing their guilt, well, Adam and Eve try something else. They begin to blame shift. They begin blaming one another. They accuse the other and the serpent and even God himself of being the source of the problem. But of course, they will not take ownership, right? Pride, their prideful hearts will not allow them to take ownership of their problem. So they turn and they blame shift and they point the finger. And so, my friends, let's get honest for a minute. How good are you at the blame game? We would like to think that this kind of mature, this, this type of behavior is, is for immature children. But come on, right? When our relationships aren't working, when our job performance isn't meeting expectations, when something is going wrong in the household, it's easy to accuse someone else for the mess, isn't it? It's easy to filter out the wrongdoing and the wickedness in ourselves as we filter out the right doing and the goodness in other people. It's easy and appealing to find a scapegoat and someone other than ourselves to blame the mess on. And my friends, this type of behavior was eventually given a name in Scripture. They realized that this type of behavior was so poisonous and toxic and disruptive to God's ideal it was the complete opposite of what we were created to do, right? God was taking creation in a particular direction. He was driving the world somewhere. He was turning all of the darkness and all of the chaos into something beautiful and functional, and he was bringing it somewhere. And this type of behavior, this type of existence on the planet takes all of God's goodness and it drives it backwards into the darkness. And it drives it backwards into the chaos. It is adverse to what God was trying to do with the world and his intentions for humans, and his intentions for creation. And so the people labeled this type of behavior, this pride-filled behavior that drags creation backwards instead of pushing it forwards. They gave this type of behavior a title. The word that the ancients gave this was this. It's a Hebrew word combined of three letters, a sheen, a tate, and a noon. Now in the Hebrew language, they did not have vowels, but those little T-like um, accents underneath the Tate and the Noon are A's. We pronounce it Satan. Early on, this wasn't a personal name. This is a theology before Satan took on a characteristic, a personal name. It was a description of a behavior. It literally means adversary. It's action and thought that is adverse to God's intentions. It drags creation backwards instead of pushing it forwards. It's behavior that throws under, other people under the bus so that we might escape unscathed or maybe just a little less scathed at least. It's behavior that degraded someone else so we could be puffed up. It's behavior that blamed others while not taking ownership in any of the wrong. It's behavior that pointed the fingers and spoke guilt and shame over others without acknowledging that we are at fault. It's behavior that says, I didn't do it. It wasn't me, it's not my fault, even though, in fact, I was to blame. It is the behavior of the prideful heart. So what does Adam do when God asks him why he's hiding and why he's covered up and what he's done? Well, it's that woman you put in here with me, God. She gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. God, it's not my fault. I'm actually the last person responsible here. Yeah, it's that woman's fault, and if we're to be honest, God, you're the one who put here with me, so it's kind of your fault. I mean, male chauvinism was the first response to sin. And it has existed and penetrated every society since. 
And so God says, Adam, you stay put. I'll deal with you in a minute. He turns to Eve and asks, what have you done? Well, the serpent deceived me. And so I ate. God, it's not my fault. If you're looking for the responsible party, it's not me. It's that serpent. God says to Eve, you stay put. I'll deal with you in a minute. And so he turns to the serpent and says, because you have done this, cursed are you above all the livestock and all the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. Remember that the serpent comes into this garden. He's slithering into this garden. He is in his upright attacking position, right? Spewing venom of words, accusations at its people. He's up in attack mode, posed to thrust forward and pounce on its prey. And so when God says that, yeah, you, the serpent, the embodiment of evil, the emblem of evil, that you are going to crawl on your belly, he's not saying that snakes used to have legs. He is saying that you will be humbled. Your attack position will be no more. I'm going to thrust you down. You are not going to harm my people. I am going to do away with you. You will submit to my plans for this creation. Ultimately, I'm going to bring this creation under my rule and under my authority. You will not have the last word, is what he is saying. And because this is not God's ideal for the world, and he this, you know, created this disruption, right? That's really what the serpent did. He created this very chaotic disruption. He, he took creation that was advancing forward and he pulled it back into darkness. God states here at the very beginning that one day, evil is going to be done away with. I'm going to humble the serpent as I do away with evil. I will put death to death, but this redemption is going to be exceptionally costly. He continues, he says, I am going to create enmity between you and the women and between her offspring and yours. Enmity is really just this idea that there's going to be a a deep-seated hatred between humanity and evil, right? The offspring of the serpent is not more serpents. The offspring of the emblem of evil is evil upon the world. And the offspring of humanity is humanity, or the offspring of Eve is humanity. And so God is saying, one day, I'm going to take a human figure and I'm going to defeat evil. He will crush your head, evil serpent of chaos. This man who is going to come into the world one day will crush your head even as you strike his heel. One day there will be a man born of woman who will kill the serpent, the emblem and the representation of evil even as that serpent puts him to death. I invite the band forward. We're going to sing a final song as we reflect on what we've learned today for just one more minute. So this Friday is Good Friday. It's the day we recognize that Jesus died upon a cross. It wasn't good because, you know, some wonderful thing happened for Jesus, for God. It was good because of what transpired. It's good because that... It's good. It's good. It's a good Friday. Because redemption was won. Because this was the day that the serpent's head was crushed. This was the day that much good came about. That pride, the satanic type of behavior that is adverse to God's intentions for us, that drags creation back into darkness and back into chaos. This type of behavior, this type of spirit was put to death. Here's how Paul described it to the Colossians. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, right? when in your pride you were self-centered, dragging creation backwards into chaos, God made you alive with Christ. See, God came to us in our greatest time of need to reverse the effects of sin. And how did he do this? Well, he forgives us all of our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He is taking it away and nailing it to the cross. Right? By his love upon sinners through the crucifixion of Jesus, he reoriented our hearts, he bent them back outwards, and he reoriented our purpose upon the planet. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, the creature of chaos and the embodiment of evil, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Or in other words, Jesus crushed the head of the serpent, even as the serpent struck his heel. There is a story in the book of Numbers when the Israelites are complaining that they have no food, no water. They actually want to go back to Egypt, that place where all they knew was suffering and all they knew was misery, misery and horrible 
the, uh, the expression uh, that their life was. They want to go back there where they were slaves and under the cruel thumb of the Pharaoh. They had so quickly forgotten what life was like, right? They're only gone about a year and a half at this point, and they already have complained. Every single month, on average, they complain. They say, I want to go back. I want to go back. It's time to go back. They had forgotten what it was like in Egypt, and so God sends, this is, this is in the book of Numbers, God sends serpents, snakes, in among their camps to remind them of what life was like in Egypt and how they were not a people meant to go backwards into chaos and into darkness, but they were meant to go forwards into his love and into his redemption. They are not meant to dig creation back into darkness and chaos, but he liberated them from the oppression and darkness in order that they might then be a light to the world, that through this nation all of the world would come to know who God is. They quickly remember their misery when they are bitten by these snakes, as most of us probably would, right? They remember the emblem of that Pharaoh. They remember how snakes were destroying Egyptian economy. And they begin to apologize for the behavior. And so God then tells Moses to cast a bronze snake upon a pole and to lift it high up in the air so that any time anyone is bitten by a snake, they may look upon that bronze snake upon that pole and they would be healed. This eventually became the universal symbol of healing. Jesus picks up the same idea in the Gospel of John when he says this. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. Friends, before Christ, our hearts are full of pride, aren't they? And it's killing us, and it is destroying our relationships. We've all been bitten by the serpent of chaos. We've all been bitten by the serpent of pride, and it has turned our hearts inward. And our behavior is adverse now to how we are created, and in this way, our behavior is satanic. It drags creation and others back into darkness and chaos. And my friends, you hate it. You, you hate this behavior. You hate it when you see it in others, and I believe that you hate it when you see it in yourself. You know that you're not right. You know that you're hurting. You know that you're hurting others. And you've tried to fix it, right? Everybody is religious. Except followers of Jesus. Did you know this? Everybody is trying to fix the problem themselves. Everybody is trying to do something themselves to fix the problem that they know they have, except followers of Jesus. We are literally the only people on the planet who are not religious. Because we do not rely on what we do to fix the problem of our prideful, sinful, satanic hearts. We rely on what Christ has done on our behalf. The only solution is to believe upon Jesus who has been lifted up high and to cast our gaze and our sight upon him and to rely and to trust on what he has done for us. And so I'm going to close our, our time in a prayer. And if you recognize this morning that you have a prideful heart, that there is something in you that is hurting and it is hurting others, you have behavior that is blaming and, and you have behavior that is adverse to what God is intending, pushing you into a love relationship with him, manifesting in love relationship with others, and you keep in that pride, you keep self-centered and you're self-absorbed and you're self-defending all the time, and you keep dragging your family back into darkness, you keep dragging your family back into chaos, you keep dragging your own heart back into darkness and chaos because you have not submitted or surrendered to the love of Christ for you and what he has done for you, you have not relied on that, my friends. I want to invite you this morning to cry out to God and to look upon the cross and to discover your healing. And this isn't a magic prayer. There's nothing special about these words that are going to do this for you. But if you submit and you surrender your heart to what God has accomplished for you today, instead of relying on your own power and your own goodness to do it, my friends, healing will begin for you. And so I invite you to pray with me. Heavenly Father, I recognize right now that I am a man who struggles with pride. Or for this congregation, Father, a woman who struggles with pride. 
We are people, Father, who have hearts that are bent in. We are self-centered. We are self-focused. We are selfish, self-preserving, self-defending, Father. And we are not living as we were intended, Father. We are not living in love relationship with you and love relationship with others, Father. We acknowledge that there are times, many, many times perhaps, more times than we would like, that we take creation and we drag it backwards into darkness and into chaos. And Father, pride, our pride does not want to admit that. Our pride wants to keep us believing that we're fine. But right now, Father, I want to condemn our pride. And if it means humbling ourselves, Father, let's do that, Father, because it's the only way that we can move forward, Father. Humble us so that we might acknowledge that we are sinners who have rebelled against you. And now, Father, as we acknowledge that, Father, I pray that we might gaze upon your Son hanging upon that cross where our sin is condemned alongside of him. He became sin in the flesh so that we would not have to stand before you condemned. Thank you, Father, for what you have done for us. This is not about what we do. This is not about how good we are. This is not about us fixing problems, Father. This is about laying down our lives. This is about surrender. This is about submission to what you have accomplished for us. I trust in what you have done for me. And now, Father, I ask that you would do a good work in my heart and that you would begin to unravel that pride and you would begin to turn my heart outward in love for you and love for others so that I can be a great participant with purpose in moving this creation forward. It's not about me. Pride wants to tell me it's all about me. It's not, though, Father. It's not. It's about you and what you have done for me. And so thank you. Thank you for this gift of grace. Thank you for this mercy that you've bestowed upon me. Thank you for your generosity, Father. May I live my life well in the shadow of the cross. And it is because of what you have done that we pray. Amen. For those of you in in person, would you please stand as we conclude our time together? Well, I search the world, but it couldn't fill me. Well, man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. And you came along and put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. And nothing is better than you. I'm not afraid to show you my weakness or prideful. My failures are flaws, but you've seen them all and you still call me friend. Because the God of the mountains is the God of the valley. There's not a place your mercy and grace will find me again. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. (laughs) 
You turn mourning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. So, Father, we thank you for what you have done for us, for turning this grave into a garden, for transforming our lives, Father. It's not because of what we could do or ever could do or what have done, Father. It's all because of what you've accomplished in our behalf. I pray that you would continue to put this, this creature of chaos to death in us, Father, as we participate in his image, Father, through our prideful hearts. Continue to rid us of that, Father, weed after weed, pull it out of this garden, More of Jesus, less of us. More of Jesus, less of us. More of Jesus, less of us. Thank you, Father, for who you are and what you've done for us. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who Let's give him praise one more time. Turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Well, nothing is better than you. Because of what he's done for us. Amen. Thanks for joining us today, guys. God bless you all.